What's up guys, the Bobcat here, and welcome to the uh, next part of the uh, Dark Souls 2 DLC. We are going to be doing the Crown of the Ivory King. Now, this part isn't going to be part of the main series. It's going to be in the playlist, but it's not going to be uh, one of the main parts, because the DLC hasn't been unlocked yet. As far as I know, I haven't actually checked. But I have the item to uh, unlock the door that is there, the frozen flower. So we're going to be going over to the Shrine of Winter, which, if I remember how to get there, it's before Drang Lake Castle, so we need to head to the Ruined Forked Road. Uh, where is it? But in this part, um, I'm going to be talking mostly about the law points I have discovered for myself and well mostly just law about the old Iron King and the DLC of that part anyway and what else I suppose that's it really just talking about the law of the uh, old Iron King quick note to people be careful of these goblins they will mess you up given the chance also, if you want strange weapons, these are the ones to go to because they drop weapons they shouldn't be carrying, as do the spiders next to the Duke's dear Freya, those ones, all the way down there. In fact, first time I killed one, I got a Mastodon Greatsword, and he just threw a rock at me. So, get down. So you may have also noticed that my character is uh, wearing a slightly different armor set than he did last time. This is the Fume Knight's armor set, or, as it's also known, Raim's armor set, or Raimi. It depends how you want to say it. I don't think it matters tremendously, but some people might be picky about that. So yeah, Raim. And where have we heard his name before? I wonder. Could it be the Rebel's Great Shield? It is. Raim and Velstat were known as the left and right arms of the king. Oh, hang on, goblin. I forgot he was here. We'll go back to that in a second. So yeah, I want to be talking about the law of Fume Knight, uh, Old Iron King, and Sir Alon. As well as some other little bits of law. So we're at the Shrine of Winter. Let's go to uh, the new DLC hub area, see what it's like. I also want to keep this part a little short so I can upload it via tonight. Via tonight? By tonight. Ooh. Oh. Hello. Now this is interesting. Um, got more of those weird gravestone type things. Try rolling then looking carefully. I don't see anything. Oh! I see. <laughs> Took me a minute then. We're covered in snow. That's pretty cool. I like that. So, let's see if the door actually opens. If it does, I'll be amazed. Oh! Okay. Well, I'm going to get recording the next part. As soon as it's done. Also, the snow is killing me. But, uh, let's head back to the Shrine of Winter. And then I will, uh, actually begin recording the part. Because I thought it came out tomorrow. Turns out I was wrong. So yeah, I'm going to be recording that in like 10 minutes after this part is done. So we'll hop down here so we've got a nicer area. So, first things first, I want to talk about the law of the Fume Knight, or Raimi. Or Raim, if uh, you want to say it. So first things first, we'll, we'll look at the Rebel's Great Shield. Rebel's Great Shield. Raim and Velstadt were known as the left and right arms of the king until their wills clashed and Raim was deemed a traitor. So, from this we can tell that Raim was a very, very powerful individual. He was the left arm of the king because Velstad was the right. So, incredibly powerful individual. However, he was branded a traitor for some reason. Uh, apparently, he, he and the king, or he and Velstad, fell out over some reason and as such uh, became enemies. Now after he was branded an en a traitor 
the rebel Veltstadt after his defeat at the hand the rebel Rame after his defeat at the hands of Veltstadt came to Broom Tower in search of greater strength. So Rame fought Veltstadt and was defeated. Which is pretty impressive. To say he wasn't killed by Velstadt for a start, but in my opinion Rame seems more powerful, but then again he was given more power via, uh, by um, Nadler or Nadalia. So when he found it, it came not from the regal father figure like before, but from the newfound mother who gave him true purpose. And I don't have his weapons, unfortunately, but his weapons also have more law. So, and I know I'm saying so a lot. Rame, very powerful individual, who was the left hand of the king, the left arm. However, him and the king, or him and Velstad, fell out over some something we don't know. Then, he fought the Velstadt and lost, and he fled to Broom Tower, where he tried to search for the old Iron King, who he hoped could give him greater strength, train him to become stronger. However, when he got there, he found Nedalia, and he was powerful enough to dispel the curse that overheld Broom Tower, this is said on his weapon, but instead he decided to accept the power of Nedalia and protect her. And that is what happened to Rame, or Rami. So a very interesting bit of lore behind him. And I must admit, I do like his armour a lot. It looks very cool. It reminds me a lot of the Artoria set, except without the stupid legs, which that one had. But yeah, I like this armour set a lot. So that's Rame covered. Now we move on to Sir Alon. I'll even put on his special sword, which I have. So, Sir Alon. He was a warrior. Let's read his description first. A katana forged from the soul of Sir Alon. Yeah, yeah. Alon came from the east, and soon, and soon became the Iron King's most trusted knight. When he departed, the old Iron King bequeathed Sir Alon's name to his iron warriors. So from this, Sir Alon was a powerful warrior who came from the east. And there's more lore, I think, on his armor. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Sir Alon came to the land from the east, he and chose to serve a little known and unestablished lord, and helped him become the old Iron King. So, Rame, not Rame, Alon came from the east. He was very powerful, and he met with the weak lord, known as the old Iron King. This is obviously before he became the Iron King, and he helped the Iron King become the Iron King. Then, at the peak of the Iron King's power, Sir Alon left. He went out on another journey, as it says. Then, at the peak of the sire's power, his sire's ruler, can't speak. Then, at the very peak of his sire's rule, Sir Alon set out again in search of lands yet unknown. So, Sir Alon came from the east, helped the old Iron King establish a kingdom, and then left. And because of this, because he was so trusted and by the Old Iron King, the Old Iron King gave his name to all his Iron Soldiers, the Elon Knights. Now, I believe there's some more lore bits on the crown as well, if I'm not mistaken. The Scotch Iron, he became Icarus Earth. Okay, so it's not on that piece, but there is a piece of equipment somewhere, I don't remember where, has more lore on it. It might be the hammer of the old Iron King, which I think I have. I don't think I have it on me. Uh, no, I don't. Which is unfortunate. So, the old Iron King was weak originally. He was a very weak individual. Then, two things happened to the old Iron King. First, Sir Alon arrived, and gave him a really powerful warrior, in the form of himself. Then, the old Iron King came into power, came to possess this power, which allowed him to mould metal really easily. And, with such powers, he conquered the neighbouring provinces, and created the old Iron King. Now, here's something which I figured out, and I'm not entirely sure on, but I think it's solid is that 
the bell in Belfry Sol, I think it's the bell of Arkin. The bell of Arkin doesn't, it actually was conquered by the old Iron King. So the old Iron King was a minor lord in unestablished land next to Arkin and Vem. And during his rise, he conquered Arkin. That is why it is in Iron Keep. Because it makes no sense, because the king wasn't of Arkin. He was the old Iron King, not the king of Arkin. So Arkin was conquered by the old Iron King, and that is why the bell is in Iron Keep. It, it's not particularly. It seems to make sense to me. It's not particularly solid though because Iron Keep sank into lava, which it was created by the old Iron King, who, by the way, was uh, became obsessed with his power, and he created the Smelter Demon, which he tried to fight, but the Smelter Demon cut him down in one blow. This is said on the law of the Smelter Demon Sword. And then he was thrown into the volcano where he fused with Icarus Earth and became um, that big monstrosity fire demon thing we see now. So that's the law so far of what I've worked out of Rame, the Fume Knights, Sir Alon, and the Old Iron King. I hope that was legible to you all. I really do. Now, I just remembered something as well. Another thing I wanted to go over in this this uh, little prelude video was the weapons and things I had missed. For a start, the bewitching, bewitching along sword. Now it looks like a, it's a first of its type. It's a great katana class. It says katana, but it's a special. It's got a halberd move set as well as its own little gimmicks to it. But one thing I didn't pay attention to was this. Yes, we stab ourselves and the weapon becomes imbued with power. That is pretty cool. Also, another thing I missed was on the Majestic Greatsword. If we read the law of the Majestic Greatsword, it says uncannily every every last one of the prominent swordsmen who hurted this weapon was left handed. That just didn't occur to me at the time, but if we use it in our right hand, we get sort of a standard greatsword moveset. However, if we were to say equip it in our left hand, something very interesting happens. So that is Artorius' spinning attack and if we two-hand it I don't think we can do it. Doesn't look like we can. That's Artorius' spinning attack. The other move it does is sort of a leaping attack. I can't do it, I don't think, because I don't have the stat requirements. I don't have the 20 faith and 20 intelligence. But it does have a jumping spinning attack, which is pretty cool. So, that's the uh, things I missed during the last part. And I hope you guys liked this little uh, law bit, which I've just done. You know, Cook the weapons in the right hands again. And now, I'm going to get started on the DLC because I didn't realise the door opened. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this little part and I will see you all in part one of our run through of the crown of the Ivory King. Actually, before we do, one last thing, which I nearly forgot. We need to look at the law on the fruits and flower. A stone ornament shaped like a flower, cold enough to dampen the greatest heat, opens the path to the Shrine of Winter, from the Shrine of Winter. So, not much on that one compared to the other two, but that is that. I believe that's everything I have missed. Uh, there's also the things about Nedalia, which I missed. It was something like she came to the Iron King in search of a husband, but he was already dead, so she uh, obviously went to protect his belongings. So, hope you guys have enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time in part one.